Hello and welcome back to this low-level JavaScript series on building a 16-bit virtual machine from scratch. In this episode, we're going to implement two features in the assembly language of the machine. The first is the ability to specify named arbitrary data in line with the assembly code. This data will actually appear inside the assembled binary. And the second is the ability to specify named constants, whose values can be used meaningfully in the assembly code. The declaration of these constants will not appear anywhere in the assembled binary, but references to them will be replaced with the value that they represent. The named data is declared with either the data8 or data16 keywords. I explained in more detail how these worked in the assembly language tour video, but let's take a moment to recap. We haven't built the module system yet, but when it's in place, we'll be able to export symbolic names, like those used in data blocks or labels. The way that's done is with the plus character. Then the keyword data8 or data16 tells the assembler that we're going to declare some inline data. We have the symbolic name followed by the equal sign and a block defined with curly braces. Inside the braces, we have a comma separated list of hex literals. So all in all, this should be a fairly simple structure to parse. Let's create a new file in the assembler slash parser directory called data.js, bringing in arcsecond, valid identifier, and hex literal from common, and the type wrapping functions. Our data parser will be a function taking a size and returning a coroutine parser. Since we may or may not have a plus character for symbolizing the export, we'll use possibly to tell arcsecond not to fail if it doesn't find the character. Possibly returns null if parsing was unsuccessful and the value otherwise. We can cast the entire expression to boolean, getting true or false for whether we should export. Next, we expect the string data followed by the size. There'll be white space and then the name, which we can capture with a valid identifier parser. Then we have the equals character, a left curly brace, and all of this interspersed with white space. Now, to extract the values, we need hex literals separated by commas that might or might not be surrounded by white space. Let's scroll above and write some specialized parsers to express these concepts. The idea of one parser being potentially surrounded by white space is actually quite useful, and there are a number of ways that we could achieve that. We might, for example, say that it's a function taking a parser and returning a sequence of optional white space, the parser, and then some more optional white space. And at the end, we can map the result to extract the inner value. We also might write it as a function taking a parser and then returning optional white space, chained into the parser, and again chained into optional white space, and then mapping the result back to the original value from our parser. But I think most expressively we could use between which is a triply curried function allowing us to supply the left, right, and value parsers. If we supply optional right space for both the left and the right, we get back a function waiting for a value parser. There's often many different ways to achieve the same thing, and it's quite rare that one way is objectively better than another. It often depends on what you're trying to achieve in the moment. If that's making code more readable, then you can choose the least complex solution. If it's performance, you might want to choose something that's a little harder to read, but perhaps runs faster, or uses less stack frames, or generally drops to a lower level of abstraction. In this case, we haven't done any performance measurements, and so let's choose the most expressive solution. And with all of that out of the way, let's write a comma-separated parser, which uses setBy, and specifies the separator as an optional whitespace surrounded comma character. Scrolling back down, we can use that in our data parser to get values, comma separated hex literals. Some more white space, a closing curly brace, and consuming any leftover white space in a neighborly fashion. We don't have a type wrapper function yet, so we can open assembly parser types to add one for our data. While we're here, let's add one for constant as well and export them both at the end. And then we simply need to return the size, name, values, and the flag for whether this was exported. When we export, we can create a key for data8, which we can supply the size 8 to, and one for data16. The constant parser is simpler. 
Again, we'll create a new file with arcsecond required along with all the common parsers and type functions. Like the data parser, the constant parser will first check to see if a symbolic name will be exported, and we can use exactly the same approach as we did before. We'll pass the keyword constant, some white space, and then the name. More white space, the equal sign, and then the value as a hex literal, surrounded by white space on both sides. In the end, we'll return a constant type with the name, value, and export flag included. At the end of the file, we can module export the constant parser. In the main parser file, we can require all the parsers that we just wrote and include them in the choice array that defines the entire assembly structure. Now, this is fairly simplistic and potentially a strange way to do things since it will allow the programmer to create data blocks right in line with the assembly code or declare a constant anywhere in the file. And there's nothing that really makes that a problem, but it would be a kind of strange way to organize code. For now, we'll just go with it. Parsing, of course, is only one side of this equation. We need to be able to take the structured representation of this assembly and turn it into machine code. So let's open up the assembler index file and change our example to include some of the features that we've just implemented. We can create an unexported constant called code constant with a value of C0DE. Then we can export an 8-bit data block called bytes containing the values 1, 2, 3, 4, followed by an unexported 16-bit data block containing 0506, 0708, 090A, and OBOC, a label that signifies the start of the code and a single move instruction referencing the code constant variable. The export markings won't do anything for now, other than testing that our parsers can correctly handle the cases where they are and are not present. When we implement the module system, that's when we'll start using these for real. We're going to have to make our code a little bit more sophisticated to handle these changes. First of all, let's actually check if any errors occurred during parsing and throw them if they did. Then we can scroll down to our resolving labels code and replace the instruction or label with a more appropriate name. Let's use the name node, as each item in the results array is actually a node from our AST, and each node should be processed according to its type. The purpose of this block is to traverse through all the nodes and build up a mapping between symbolic names and the values that they represent. So far, the only symbolic names that we've been dealing with have been labels, but now, since we also have constants and data, let's change the name to be a little bit more abstract. Since we have more than two node types to deal with now, let's also convert this if-else block into a switch statement instead, which I personally think is clearer for this kind of code. In the case where we have a constant, we need to do almost the same thing as if it were a label. We'll add an entry to the symbolic name table using the name of the constant, but instead of using the current address as the value like we do with a label, we'll use the past value of the constant ending its value with FFFF just to ensure that the number is not larger than 16 bits. If we're dealing with a data node, on the other hand, then we can record the name of the data in the symbolic name table along with the current address, but we also need to increment the current address by the size of this data block. Each value takes up either one or two bytes, depending on whether this is 8 or 16 bit data. And the total size in bytes is the number of values in each data block multiplied by the byte size of each value. We can add that to the current address and then break. Next, we can scroll down to where the actual encoding takes place. Again, let's rename this iterated value to node in order to better represent what we're actually doing here. This part of the code takes instructions or data and creates a sequence of machine code bytes that the VM interprets. Previously, we were skipping the node if it were a label, but now we should also skip constants since the declaration of these constants only happens in the assembly language. If the node type is data, we can check the size and call either encode data 8 or encode data 16 with a return at the end. To encode 8 bit data, we need to iterate through every byte of the node.value.values, passing an integer from the hexadecimal string and pushing the value into the machine code array. We can end the data with FF to ensure that if the data were larger than 8 bits, 
only the low byte would end up in the machine code array. Encode data 16 is very similar, so I'll copy paste encode data 8 as a starting point. We have to push two bytes now, and the first byte will be the passed value added with FF00 to isolate the top part and then shift it to the right by 8 bits to get the true value. And to test this out, we can run the assembler on the file and see the generated bytes. The first four bytes represent the bytes that we declared with data 8. The next eight bytes represent the words that we declared with data 16. 1b is the opcode for move literal to memory, and the value being moved here is C0DE, the value that we associated with code constant. And the last two bytes is for the literal address 1234. And with these new features, the assembly language is a little bit more powerful and a little bit better equipped to allow the programmer to express more complex ideas and constructs. If you're enjoying this series, share it with a friend or coworker. And to make sure that you never miss an episode, hit subscribe or join the mailing list over at tinyletter.com forward slash low level JavaScript. Thanks to all the patrons of this channel, your continued support helps make these videos what they are. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.